July 21st, 2009 meeting of the Ordinance Committee of the City Council to order. We are uh, handling proposed amendments to the 2007 fire code about uh, fire sprinkler requirements. Proceed. Good afternoon, uh, Chair, and uh, we were bringing this for the uh, second time to the Ordinance Committee. Uh, with uh, some changes, so we wanted to update you on the changes and um, and talk a little bit about the uh, proposed uh, sprinkler amendments and um, what we've done in the interim. Uh, if you recall, uh, the last city council meeting, a few uh, elements came up um, that we are now going to present back in uh, in the form of frequently asked questions. Uh, so, in any case, um, we'll. Uh, uh, Shorten the PowerPoint program a little bit this time around, um, but go over those uh, those questions. Um, beginning with a little bit of history, uh, the proposed uh, modifications uh, will amend uh, uh, the Municipal Code Chapter 8.04, um, uh, the adopting ordinance of the 2007 Fire Code. Um, it was originally written uh, to coincide with the adoption on uh, January 1 of 2008. Uh, and it contains uh, amendments to the sprinkler requirements that are already in the code, um, but these sprinkler requirements will make uh, uh, will be more stringent than the 2007 uh, fire code. On March 24, 2009, uh, we presented this to the Ordinance Committee for the first time, uh, and then on April 14th, uh, the amendments came before City Council. Uh, at that time. Uh, two main elements came up. Uh, one was the uh, uh, questions regarding the water supply and the 5 8 inch uh, uh, water meters uh, that the city operates, 20 gallons per minute. Uh, and the other one that came up uh, uh, was a citizen who spoke uh, regarding the uh, square footage uh, thresholds for residential remodels and uh, additions. Uh, so council direct, uh, directed staff to create a frequency ask, frequently asked questions uh, document um, regarding both of those things, and that's attached as attachment number two to your packet. Uh, in addition, staff reviewed the proposal to uh, uh, change the residential thresholds. So the proposed amendments, as we originally wrote it, will require sprinklers in all new construction, including single-family residences, except detached utility uh, buildings. And it will require sprinklers in uh, single-family residential remodels and, addi and additions greater than 50% of the square footage or 1,000 square feet. That's the way we originally had it. The suggestion was to eliminate the 50% requirement and change that to 75%. And in addition to that, to eliminate the 1,000 square foot threshold. Uh, so if we accepted both of those, it would look basically like this. It would require sprinklers in single-family uh, residential construction uh, greater than 75%, uh, and that's either a remodel or an addition um, of the square footage, and then the 1,000 square foot uh, bottom threshold uh, would be removed. So the changes were proposed to prevent undue hardship uh, on homeowners in, in performing minor remodels. Uh, and the justification there was that uh, for a minor remodel of 1,001 square feet, that the entire home would have to be uh, retrofitted with sprinklers. Um, we did not believe that that significantly altered the intent or the scope of the ordinance as we presented it. Uh, and, uh, and we didn't have a problem accepting those changes. Uh, it was uh, slightly late in, in the process, but uh, because the uh, ordinance remained fundamentally unchanged, uh, we decided that, uh, that it, it was something that uh, would be acceptable to staff. So the proposed amendments uh, will also require sprinklers throughout the building and commercial occupancies uh, where greater than 50% of the total square footage is remodeled. And uh, previously that was 25% in the scope of the uh, uh, give and take of the public meetings. Um, we changed that at the request of stakeholders also. And these sections remain unchanged. There's nothing different about that. The installation standards are NFPA 13, 13R, and 13D. 13D is the one that's key here, and that's the one that uh, uh, is the standard for uh, single-family construction. Uh, it's a much lighter requirement than the commercial construction. It doesn't require four-inch taps off the main and so forth. You can use domestic water, and, and uh, there are uh, several other workarounds within that. Um, for instance, in 13D systems, you don't have to cover certain areas within a home that you would normally have to cover in a commercial occupancy. A bathroom would be a good example of that. 
So among the questions asked, and this one was also key, is is the city's 5 8 inch 20 GPM water meter sufficient to supply water to your average single family residents? Uh, we believe it's an important question. Uh, it's, it's one that uh, we spent a lot of time in, in talking to various people. Uh, none of us are engineers in the fire department uh, in, in terms of engineering uh, water systems, um, but we did get the opinions of uh, several engineers. And we also talked to uh, people on, on our local networks and statewide networks um, about uh, in, in the varying opinions of, of will that type of a water system work? And we found that it's a very difficult question to answer in cookie cutter fashion. Uh, part of the reason for that is because every home is calculated differently. Um, there are many different aspects to a single family residence. Um, every change of a direction of pipe, for instance, the length of the underground, the length of, of uh, the residence, whether it's one story, two story, all of these things play a role in, in exactly um, how much water is needed. Um, but one of the things that we found out is that, uh, you, you know, for our purposes, we've allowed single-family residential sprinkler systems as a mitigation measure for many years now. And uh, in, in the course of doing that, we have, uh, in my memory, I can't remember the last time the 5 8 inch meter didn't work, uh, it didn't calculate out. Uh, but each home, as I was saying before, is calculated uh, independently. Other options that were allowed are uh, on-site water and pumps, upgrading the water meter to a one inch, um, which is, and, and we'll cover the costs associated with that in a moment. And uh, we also have the option of a direct non-metered fire line, a two inch fire line directly off the main. Uh, doesn't operate on a water meter at all. Some of the potential costs associated with that, and I'm, I'm outlining them here because what we found is that we, because we couldn't answer the question about 5 8 inch water supply uh, to a 100% certainty, um, we're going to outline the costs that would occur or could occur if a home didn't calculate out on that water meter and they had to upgrade. If you look at uh, the column on the left, the 5 8 inch water meter supply, the connection fee is 2,041 currently under public works standards. And the connection fee for the one inch is $2,506. So there is a difference of $465. It's greater with the one inch than it is with the 5 eighths inch. And I'm not calculating the annual water usage here. I'm only calculating the, the rental fee and the installation fee. The subsequent years, $143.40 for the 5 8 inch meter versus $358.80 for the uh, 1 inch meter. Um, and so that's a difference of $215 annually. If you were to connect a 2 inch fire line without a meter, the annual fee for that would be $55.92. However, since you're building, theoretically, a single family residence, you would also have to connect the 5 8 inch water supply anyway. Um, so you would have to you would have the the combination of one hundred and forty three dollars and fifty five ninety two uh, together. So the annual fee for that water supply sprinkler system and domestic system both would be one hundred ninety nine dollars and thirty two cents. So these are the costs that are associated um, with the three different options. Now the estimated cost uh, in in Santa Barbara, I think we discussed this at the last meeting is that uh, at 100, uh, the national average is, is $1.61, which we found to be uh, extremely low for construction costs in the city of Santa Barbara. Um, we found an average uh, to be more along the lines of $3 a square foot uh, to sprinkler a home in Santa Barbara. Um, so uh, that still comes in at less than 1% of the cost of the home, um, but that is an actual cost that would have to be uh, borne. Uh, insurance offsets range between 2 and 20 percent, but it depends on the carrier. So the new sections and how they would differ, and this is, these are uh, for the most part the same charts that we put up before. Um, in commercial existing, uh, the way we have the sprinkler ordinance now, sprinklers are required in new construction greater than 5,000 square feet. Additions to buildings are greater than 5,000 square feet. Um, also requires sprinklers throughout. 
Uh, the change of use to more than, to a more hazardous use in any building over 5,000 square feet also triggers the uh, sprinkler ordinance, and remodels to existing buildings uh, don't trigger sprinklers at all. That's the existing ordinance. Under proposed, the proposed uh, sprinklers in all new construction, additions to buildings, uh, changes of use to more hazardous regardless of square footage, and remodels to existing buildings involving greater than 50% of the existing square footage. In the residential currently, there's no sprinkler ordinance for single family homes. In the new, it would be an NFPA 13D sprinklers required in all new construction of single family residences and duplexes, and additions to buildings of that type involving greater than 75% of the existing square footage, um, and remodels also greater than 75% of the existing square footage. Again, a few statistics on the uh, sprinklers and their life safety properties. 78% of all structure fire occurs in residential property. In every 79 seconds, there's a fire. 83% um, of fire deaths. Uh, you're much more likely to die of a fire that occurs in your own home uh, than you are in a fire like the T fire or the Hazel Zeta fire. 80% 80, 80 of fire injuries occur in, in structures of this type. 72% of structure fire property damage and 45% of fire ground firefighter deaths occur in single family homes. Residential sprinklers respond quickly. They control or extinguish the fire, preventing flashover. Um, they do their work usually before we arrive, and they generally uh, cause much less f water damage than firefighters do. And the interesting statistic is when installed with smoke detectors, the risk of death is reduced by 82%, 63% um, reduction with smoke detectors alone. Again, a few of the common myths, sprinklers don't go off all at once. They're fused so that one sprinkler goes off at a time, and, it's, and they're based on heat when they're exposed to heat. Uh, sprinklers don't cause excessive water damage. Uh, sprinklers are not activated by smoke at all. And sprinklers can be designed to blend with the architecture. So our feeling is that the sprinkler enhancements are, will uh, provide a greater protection of lives and property and match similar ordinances throughout the state and throughout the county. Uh, and supported by uh, the International Code Council and National Fire Administration and the California State Fire Marshal. And with these changes, uh, we request that uh, the ordinance be forwarded to City Council. Do I have questions from uh, community members? Mr. House. Yes, and just I want to be sh uh, thanks for the presentation and for following up on the recommendations uh, th that way. Uh, if, you, if you would turn in our uh, in the ordinance to uh, 903.2.18.5 additions to or remodels of single family residence. And, I, and I'm asking this question almost more just to have you say it out loud because I, I did see what I wanted here. And that is the definition basically of existing floor area. Um, when we talk about um, uh, exceeds 75% of the existing floor area of the building, um, there is a starting time when the clock begins ticking, and we keep track of that. And um, we do this with other things in the city as well. Um, and uh, when is that? I, I guess it starts when this ordinance is approved by city council and goes into effect, and that's the beginning point after which we keep track? Yes, that's the current plan. Okay. I think that if somebody were just hearing existing floor area, just heard it, maybe even over the counter or something, they would think that would be at that from that moment, you know, like what just looking at their their home or whatever their addition might be. And it's not. It it would go they'd have to go back and get some assistance in calculating how much had been improved since um, whenever a month or two from now or a month from now when this goes into effect. Correct. And and it's it it's designed to be an aggregate uh, square footage every every time somebody does like 200 feet or 400 feet it all gets added together kept track of here at 630 Garden Street and then if it were to cross the line of 75 percent that's when this would require even if it was a hundred feet they were adding at that point if it goes across 75 percent that's, that's plan. And I think we talked about that the last time to it's sort of to prevent serial remodeling of, of right. the, the type that would you know a bunch of aggregate small additions that you know to get un underneath the uh, sprinkler ordinance. Good, and I know the staff is very competent in doing that. We've been doing that for garages and things like that as well. Okay, great. Thanks. That's it. Thank you. Hi, I had one question. The 
your presentation sort of brought this to my mind when you were talking about the adequacy of the of the meters and and just sort of our system wide capacity or our regional capacity. I just remember back to um, on uh, I guess day two or um, uh, or yeah, it must have been day two of the Jesusita fire um, when many people put on their sprinklers in one neighborhood. If we were extremely successful at pro promulgating new sprinkler systems, is there a problem? Is there a potential problem if we see a number of fires in the neighborhood? Is there sufficient um, water being water demand generated by the sprinkler systems that in a um, a, a wildland fire that moves into homes that we could trigger, sp you know, these residential sprinkler systems and therefore hurt our own water pressure? Generally speaking, that's not a factor. And, and part of the reason is because, and we found this in the T fire also, um, that as houses burn down, the uh, the release of water from those houses occurred at the water meter or somewhere post water meter. Um, the identical thing would happen um, as houses burned down in in a wildfire where the houses contain sprinkler systems, but it would happen at, at the fundamental level. In other words, the sprinklers may go off at some point, but as the house burns, and, and the sprinklers are not designed to put out a wildfire, but as the house burns, um, the, the water system itself would come apart at some point. And uh, the water would flow, and there's, and there's very little that we can do that about that if the house burns down. Right. Okay. That's a very good answer to that question. And um, we will open up the public hearing, but I don't have – oh, here's some speaker slips. Uh, we'll start with Mr. Hotchkiss. Thank you. Gentlemen, good afternoon. Um, first, thank you very much, Chief for taking the time to uh, listen to Joe and I and for you gentlemen for talking to Krista Pleiser. I think from the um, Board of Real Estate, uh, Board of Realtors, and uh, she was impressed with the way you listened and truly listened. And we are most pleased that uh, the suggestions that we made, both Joe and myself, Joe Campanelli, have been incorporated here. Uh, it's great to know we can work together like that. The one thing I just want to bring up, I'm not sure quite how we handle this. We were thinking of extreme cases. Sometimes you have in Santa Barbara older houses that have European corbelled roofs, for instance, some of them even imported from Europe. And if in an instance where somebody was doing a remodel that was triggered by this, how would we handle, um, uh, you know, sprinkling a roof like this, a ceiling like this, for instance, and not destroy the place. So at some point there needs to be either an appeal or a judgment or wherever so we know that we're just not going to be running sprinklers over some fabulous 16th century ceiling. So I'm not sure how uh, we get around that, but maybe there is a way. Anyway, thank you all for listening. I appreciate it. And thank you for, you know, it, it's it's common that people will say we'll have an objection, but it's better when folks will actually quantify an alternative idea. So I thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Campanelli. Thank you, council members. Um, I got to say that, you know, as a builder, my job's about problem solving, rolling up your sleeves and finding ways to do things that aren't always in the book. They're not always on the plan, and so you have to go back and find something that conforms with the design intent, with the function intent, with the cost time intent, with the intention of the code, too. And this experience has been um, pragmatic and really um, an example of good communities working together. I mean, the fire department was outstanding, and um, we sat down and just talked as if we were walking a mile in that homeowner's shoes. So I, I think that the incorporation of the 75% and the other items, they're pragmatic and practical in terms of getting the community to buy into this. We were, new construction wasn't an issue, but existing construction, if you have a coffered ceiling, like if you did this ceiling, we just did uh, Casa de Maria, and we destroyed their ceiling with a two-inch line, and they weren't happy about it. So I know that somewhere in America there's a solution to some of this stuff, and it takes being able to sit down with the building department and the fire department and say, look, I've got something outside the parameters of what you tried to write down. And what we suggested at that point was that in the case that there was a design conflict, 
that it's up to the designer and the homeowner to demonstrate that they've made every effort to mitigate that. You could go to sidewall uh, fire sprinkler heads now that, that are way more efficient than they used to be in the old days. Uh, we did that at Moby Dick's the first time it burned and got it accepted because they couldn't do the ceiling. So I think that's Frank's point. And if there could be, um, and I know you can't just write it in there because then you don't want to set a precedent where everybody thinks they have an escape route and they can bypass the intent of this code because it is a good code section. Um, and the, the only other thing I'll say is that um, um, when we come and sit down and have this kind of experience, it encourages the public to instead of trying to do an end run, what we were fearful of is that they go, I'm getting nailed by the city and the fire department and so I'm just not going to do my remodel, which hurts the economy, or I'm going to do it illegally. And nobody wins in that situation. So I just want to thank everybody for making this a perfect example of a win-win situation. Thanks. Okay. Well, I see no other public speakers, and uh, so it's to the committee. Mr. Francisco. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I also want to express my appreciation to Mr. Poiret and others in the fire department for working with people in the community and coming up with a rational solution to what otherwise could have been a something contentious. So thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Vincent, just a quick question about uh, the point that Mr. Campanelli raised. What is, I mean, in the case that there was, let's say, a remodel in, a, in the situation with some kind of exquisite ceiling that, that could be severely damaged with this kind of installation, is there any recourse Mr. Chair, members of the committee, both the building code and the fire code contain alternative compliance mechanisms. They allow the building official to consider proposals from an applicant that meet the purpose and intent and are equivalent, equivalently protective for, in this case, fire protection. How, as Mr. Campanelli mentioned, it's going to require some creative thinking on the part of the architect and the builder to come up with solutions that can be equivalently protective in the circumstances of if the if the roof is or the ceiling is not available as a location for sprinklers but there as far as building into the code or there's not i would recommend against adding in some other appeal language or something, it's already in, contained in the building code and the fire code. So the structure is there to have those considerations. It's then up to the, the creative thinking of the, the uh, architects and engineers and, and uh, builders to come up with those, those solutions. Great. Thank you very much. Mr. House. Very good. Um, and. Uh, uh, Mr. Pore, thank you very much for the work you did and the way you did that. Um, I, we, we had put this part of the fire code on hold since, what, 2007 so that we could get more input from the stakeholders. And I, I, I like the way our minds think. Sometimes you just have to get to the tail end of it. You've exhausted everything, and then suddenly the good idea pops into your head. And that's sort of really appreciated. Uh, guys, thanks very much for coming to us and bringing that. And, I, and it makes sense. But for me, it's really critical that that it be vetted through the fire department because it's the safety of our community that's the most, you know, the highest value we have here. So that's great. That's the way we want to see it working together like that. Um, so I don't. Uh, we also had a, a letter from um, Allison Spann from the uh, Association of Realtors uh, here in town and uh, supported this. Um, and I think they'll appreciate that the 1,000 square feet went away as well. And we use the 75% language in both cases. Um, and then it's 50% for the commercial. So uh, I know you may have some more things to say, but I'm ready to make a motion to move this forward. Please, Mr. Harris. Okay, well, I move that we forward the ordinance amendments to the City Council for introduction and adoption. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? And again, I just want to thank you, and, and you provide a good example for other folks if they have an objection with a proposed policy. It's always good to have... Uh, alternative language or alternative solutions being proposed. It's very constructive. Thank you.